Last month, the New York Times published an article entitled How Beijing Influences the Influencers. It was an article that took many months of research as the authors contacted a dozen of Western social media influencers living in both China and abroad, asking them a variety of questions related to their work on YouTube. Now, the overall goal of this article was very simple. Discredit the work of these foreigners who are sharing their genuine insights and stories from China and make sure that the American public continues to have a negative impression of China. In today's video, I would like to share with everybody my perspective on this article and how Western media outlets like the New York Times influence your way of perceiving China. People don't read traditional newspapers anymore, and even primetime television shows are losing viewers to podcasters and YouTubers. Don't believe me? Take a look at this graph showing the fact that podcaster Joe Rogan has nearly four times the amount of views as the highest viewed TV program by Tucker Carlson. Traditional media outlets like the New York Times are becoming less influential in this ever-changing world of social media, and they will resort to any tactic they can in order to get views. This is going to be a fun episode. Let's break it down. I'd like to start today's analysis by highlighting one of the influencers mentioned in this article. This is Raz, and he is an Israeli national who runs a YouTube channel called Why China. Raz speaks fluent Mandarin and makes quality videos conducting street interviews with both locals and expats alike. However, the authors of the New York Times article took an issue that Raz personally traveled to the controversial Xinjiang region and shared his insights into the cotton industry. Western media has continuously made claims that cotton sourced from this region is done with forced labor. However, when Raz visited local cotton farms in Xinjiang and interviewed local farmers, he found many were using American-made cotton machines to harvest the cotton. Now, last year, I decided to make a video about this topic and discussed a phenomenon that very few Western media had addressed to this point. The fact that John Deere, America's iconic tractor brand, has built an incredible market of selling cotton harvesting machines to Xinjiang. Through April 2020, sales increased over 4,000% from the year prior as local Xinjiang farmers feared the trade war between China and America would cut off their access to these high-quality American-built machines. My goal with that video was not to present Xinjiang as some utopia, but rather to try to understand what is happening in the region. American investors who hold on to John Deere stock are directly profiting from Xinjiang farmers. This absolutely has to be presented in this discussion, yet Western media outlets like the New York Times would like to make sure its readers never see videos like this of John Deere cotton machines operating in China. In response to his video to the New York Times, Raz analyzed 62 of the most recent New York Times articles that mentions China at least three times in the article. What did he find? Well, 53, roughly 85% of the articles were negative in nature. Another eight articles were neutral, and there was only one positive article that was written about China. There is a huge bias against China in Western media. By far, the clearest example I can show you came in March 2020 when China began its COVID-19 lockdown. The New York Times came out and made sure American readers viewed the Chinese government as an oppressive regime that was denying citizens basic freedoms. However, literally 20 minutes later, after slamming China, the New York Times published an identical article about the Italian government. Now, did they slam Italy for denying Italians freedom to travel and to move around? Of course not. The New York Times praised the Italian government for prioritizing its citizens' lives. If you read both of these articles on the exact same day, your brain would have subconsciously been trained to think China is bad and Italy is good. As most Westerners can identify closer to Italy than they will China, the next logical thought is Italy is doing the right thing and China is doing the wrong thing. Now, the majority of the New York Times article focuses on foreign vloggers who have worked with Chinese state media on sponsored trips. Now, I, of course, have never been on a state-sponsored trip in China, as longtime viewers of this channel know that I've been based in Vancouver, Canada, ever since I started my YouTube channel. Now, the New York Times article spends a lot of time discussing how influencers get paid and how they are able to monetize the content they produce. And I'll admit, this is a common question that many YouTubers get asked, and this is the perfect opportunity to explain the number one method that I use to monetize my channel. Sponsorships. Last year, I partnered with MTeeth, an oral healthcare company based in Shenzhen, China. When MTeeth and I first collaborated, the company was just setting up its Amazon store and wanted to break into the North American market. 
During our first collaboration, we sold hundreds of toothbrushes and helped the brand get established on Amazon with numerous five-star ratings. During my recent 45-day trip back to America, I traveled exclusively with the M-Teeth toothbrush. This is the X7 series, and incredibly, the battery on this lasts for 120 days. Now, in addition to my M-Teeth toothbrush, I also traveled with the M-Teeth water flosser. And this is a portable flosser designed specifically for travel that is the ultimate tool for oral health. There are always areas in your mouth that even an electronic toothbrush cannot reach. But the water flosser reaches every single possible spot in your mouth, giving you the best possible result. Now, since I have never personally conducted a state organized trip in China, I only had a minor appearance in this article when the author used one of my quotes. No one in the West could possibly imagine that China would be this successful. And this is the big reason why Western media is always attacking China. And at this point, I would like to further elaborate on this comment. Not only did no one in the West possibly imagine China's success and growth over the past 50 years, I would say that most Chinese citizens, including those serving in the government, also did not know how successful or fast China's rise to the number two economy in the world would be. Talk to the older generations of Chinese nationals and you will hear an amazing amount of pride in their voices. They have seen firsthand China's historic rise and its ability to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But even this fact is being questioned by Western journalists. This was a tweet sent from outspoken China critic Melissa Chan as she stated, On the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, can the world stop unquestionably accepting the propaganda narrative it lifted 500 million out of poverty? Once you drive a country aground with famine and the Cultural Revolution, there's kind of nowhere to go but up. But is Melissa right? I have two issues with this tweet. The first is the assumption that lifting hundreds of millions out of poverty is propaganda. When the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949, there were only 10 countries on the planet that were poorer than China. It is now the second largest economy in the world, and the only way that you can accomplish this is by lifting people out of poverty and creating a middle class. Let me be clear, I'm not saying that China has eliminated poverty. Even Chinese Premier Li Keqiang admitted in June 2020 that over 600 million people in China still earn about 1,000 renminbi a month. Don't forget, China has 1.4 billion people. There are hundreds of millions of people who have benefited tremendously from China's rise. The second issue is the claim that it's easy to go from the top to the bottom. But if that's the case, why do we see dozens of countries in Africa continue to be enslaved with poverty for decades? Why is Haiti still the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, despite being located only 700 miles from the United States and having received over 13 billion US dollars in foreign aid over the past 10 years? The reality is, it's not easy to go from the bottom to the top. You may not like China or its government, but I think we need to give credit where credit is due. Several months ago, I received an email from the Shanxi Tourism Board, who invited me to Shanxi to celebrate the upcoming Chinese New Year. In this email, you can clearly see exactly what is being offered and what the exact goal of this project is. Shanxi is interested in inviting foreign KOLs. This means key opinion leaders or influencers to come to the region and produce a variety of videos related to culture, travel, and Chinese New Year. In exchange for the videos, I would be offered a salary, accommodation, and a travel allowance. But here's the question that I would like to ask to you. Is this ethical for me to accept this offer? There are really two ways that one can look at this situation. Let's first show you how a New York Times reporter is trained to look at this. The Shanxi Tourism Bureau is an official tourism bureau in China under the jurisdiction of the Chinese government. Therefore, by accepting this opportunity, Cyrus would be accepting money from the Chinese Communist government. How would we present this to Western audiences? Americans are being paid by China's government to produce propaganda. Now that's certainly one way of approaching this situation, but why don't we take a look at another perspective, one that uses a little bit more logic and common sense. Cyrus is a social media influencer. It is common practice for influencers around the world to work with official tourism bureaus. The videos that Cyrus would produce would be related to travel, culture, and celebrating China's most important holiday. Nothing in these videos would be political. Again, we are talking about China the country, its people, its language, its culture. In addition, Cyrus is an American that speaks fluent Chinese, so his videos could appeal both to a local and international audience. 
there is nothing wrong with Cyrus accepting and working with a local tourism bureau in China. Let me give everybody a fantastic example. Rick Steves is one of the most well-respected and accomplished American travel content producers. A few years ago, he traveled to Iran and partnered with the Iranian government to film a travel series. That's quite amazing considering the United States has enforced trade sanctions with Iran. Do we have a double standard that exists here? Is it okay to work with other tourism agencies as long as it's not a tourism board in China? Now for the record, I have declined this opportunity to travel to Shanxi as many of you know that I am based in North America and have no timeline to return to China with the current pandemic. I brought up this email as a pure example and to have a thought experiment. What is your opinion? Please drop me a comment down below and share your thoughts. As I conclude this video, I'd like to share with you some of my final thoughts. Unfortunately, we are living in a world today where you can't say anything positive about China without being looked at as a CCP sympathizer by the media and subsequently the public. This causes us to have a very one-sided view of the world and certainly impacts those who want to express a different opinion. I'm a former China expat that enjoyed my life in China and want to give my independent view of the country based on my own experience. This is rarely seen in Western mainstream media, and I would like to fill that gap so that we can see China from all angles and foster a better and more peaceful relationship. American politicians and media paint China as a threat to take over the world and that communism must be stopped. As I mentioned in a previous YouTube video, this narrative is very similar to the domino theory hype that preceded the Vietnam War. Now I'll end this video with one final quote from Caitlin Johnstone, a fantastic independent writer that I highly recommend following. Yes, China's government is more authoritarian than yours in some ways. Also, you're being deceived about the things China's government does and the threat it poses to you by a massive sweeping propaganda campaign. Both of these things are true. They do not contradict each other. Everyone, I want to thank you for making it to this point in the video and hearing my take on this New York Times article. Last year, the United States passed the Strategic Competition Act of 2021, which is now allocating hundreds of millions of dollars to combat the rise of China. But I want people to remember one thing. The United States and China have enjoyed a prosperous relationship for over 50 years that have benefited the lives of both nation citizens. The world needs the United States and China to work together, and this is something that I will continue to strive for. Once again, I want to thank MT for sponsoring today's video, and if you're in the market for some new oral healthcare products, MT is offering their biggest online discount to subscribers of this YouTube channel. Click the links down below and you'll be able to save 30% off the retail price. If you're based in the United States, click the links and complete your purchase directly on Amazon.com. If you're outside the United States, click the link to MT's official website. Both links offer the 30% discount and both links are down in the description. And finally, if you are interested in joining our team and being part of our community here on YouTube, please consider joining our Patreon community. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to spend it with me here on YouTube, and I look forward to seeing you all in a future video. 祝大家新年快乐, 身体健康, 万事如意, 我们下次再见。